Coming up, a Sad Styles production. Hello and welcome. My name is Mike Yarenworth, signing on to the sign off for yet another week. And thank you so much for joining us, as I always say. And now at the beginning of this episode, I also want to say that we don't have any crazy special guests on this week as we have in some of our past weeks, unless that is, of course, you consider this guy to be a very special guest. And I kind of do, but I have to. It's my nature. He is my dad, Brian Aaronworth the president of Frameworth, and we're sitting down once again, just one-on-one, to talk about probably one of our most requested topics of conversation uh, that we get asked about all the time before we start recording these podcasts, and it's NFTs. You will have heard of NFTs at this point, most likely, but do you fully understand what they are? Most people don't. I don't know if I do completely. I've done my research, and I think I've got a pretty good handle on it, Uh, but it's less about the specific NFTs themselves, and it's more about the impact that they're having on the sports marketing world. We wanted to take this opportunity to show everyone or, or, or have you guys listen along as we discuss some of the past innovations that have happened, either as a result of something external that's forced us at Frameworth to uh, react and develop our own sense of uh, how to innovate or our own things that we have brought to the world of sports marketing that have forced other companies to react and uh, maybe change the game a little bit for everyone who uh, is involved from collectors to resellers to wholesalers. No one's left out of this one. That's what I'll say. All right. It affects everyone and we're sure that you guys are going to have fun with it. So that's it. I have nothing more to say. I'm just going to lead into it. We will see you guys on the other side for another fantastic interview and keep in mind, if you have any specific questions you want us to address on the podcast moving forward, feel free to hit us up. You can find us on social media. Sign off pod is the typical handle that we have or sign off pod at framework.com. We're available everywhere. We love to hear from you. Let us know your questions. And by the way, I want to put out this call to action. If you haven't done so already, it really, really helps us if you can go onto the subscription service that you use, whether it's iTunes or Spotify or Stitcher, and either subscribe, like, rate, review, whatever it is. And barring any of that, just tell a friend to give us a shot. I'm sure if you're listening to this, you know that we bring a ton to the table and all we want is to build a bigger, better community where we can reach more people and we can't do that without your help. So we will see you guys after the break when I sit down with Brian Aaronworth, the president of Frameworth, and we talk about NFTs and innovation in the world of sports marketing. All right, and welcome back. Thank you so much for joining us for yet another week. Now, this week, uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, we have kind of something, uh, a topic that a lot of people are talking about right now. It's sort of a buzzword, both in the world of sports marketing and sports memorabilia and outside of the world of sports memorabilia, and that's NFTs. Now, NFTs are not going to be the major concern of this podcast, but what we want to talk about is what happens in an industry like ours when something major comes along and shifts in a way where now we, as people who sort of run and 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 call home this this industry have to react and potentially interact with these changes do we immediately get on board do we make a version of it ourselves do we wait and hopefully it becomes more mainstream and more acceptable to to latch on to and risk missing the boat uh we have to ask ourselves these questions all the time uh frameworth you know quite often in the industry is, is trying to find ways to push it forward without the sort of uh, guidance of external factors. And we've done a lot of those over the years. And when I started to think about the ways in which we may start engaging with NFTs, um, I, I started to think back about some of the ways that we moved forward the, the, the goalposts on what would count as sports memorabilia um, without that interpretation or without without that influence. And obviously, uh, I've brought here to talk to uh, all of us about that president of Frameworth and uh, typical co-host of the Sign Off podcast, Brian Aaronworth. Brian, Hi guys. Dad, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. Just back from a little R&R up north on the French River and um, spend a couple of weeks up there trying to recoup from a long winter of, uh, I don't know, um, trying to COVID proof the company and yep. uh, we kind of reinvented a lot of things and uh, moved a lot more online. It's been very successful for us. And of course we, you've probably seen out there the new Tim Hortons mini stick launch that we mm. were um, involved with. And speaking of that, we're going to have uh, Rob Forbes at some point in the near future coming uh, on our podcast. And he's uh, been involved with marketing for Tim Hortons for many years 
Uh, we had many discussions of new ways and new, and, and apropos what we're talking about today is moving the goalposts, finding something new, and the mini sticks has certainly created a whole new channel of marketing uh, and memorabilia. Now, to to clarify, if you're not aware, because there are a lot of people listening from the United States as well, uh, when you say the mini sticks, what you're talking about is a new promotion that uh, Tim Hortons has undertaken. This is actually the second year that they're doing it. The first year that they did it was uh, was last year in the middle of COVID. So there was a lot going on. It was right after COVID sort of hit. But essentially what we have is a miniature hockey stick. It's an exact replica of the player's hockey stick down to the way they tape it uh, on the heel or on the blade and on the, the handle of the stick. Uh, the the make and model, everything is, is the same. And it's put inside a small display locker that uh, also has images of the players as well as their statistics. And that locker can be used to display it. And that's what Tim Hortons is selling right now. Similar, like think think hockey cards, the way that they do the hockey cards, except this is you go in, you buy one of six players and uh, and you bring it home and, and hopefully you're happy with it. We, we feel like we're getting some positive replies well, there. Mikey, you did an amazing job. And I think everyone at Tim's is really happy with the result. Uh, you, you're uh, very anal about detail and making sure that there are exact replicas uh, t- as close as we can get on something so small, and it right. it's amazing how good they look. Um, they're uh, in stores now, so this is the second set of six, and hopefully they'll continue to do this. I think it's a big success for them. Yep. Uh, go go out to your local Tim Hortons if you don't know what we're talking about uh, and ask to see them. They're actually really, really cool. One of the more interesting projects I've ever been involved with, and I think the finished product is something. Oh, there you go. A little bit of a Tim Hortons plug there. Which Canadians are podcasting without a cup of Tim Hortons, though? We are not sponsored by Tim Hortons, by the way. This is just this is just natural. Um, you mentioned though that you were up at the French oh River. yeah. So we started. I started by saying that we were. Uh, I took off for a couple of weeks, a few weeks back, and I just want to give a shout out to our uh, good friends at Hartley Bay, James and the boys, um, Johnny B and Stephen. The guys that uh, they came to me while I was coming through the marina, and they look after us. They're the best marine around and uh, mentioned the podcast. I said, you listen to the podcast? And <laughs> said, of course. They, they have to drive back and forth to Sudbury. It's a great time to flip it on there. Um, they, they said ba- they said back and forth to Sudbury. James mentioned to me, he saw me and he said, it's weird. I can't really look at you right now because I was just hearing your voice about 20 minutes ago when I was in the shower because he was listening <laughs> to the podcast in the shower. And I said, I said to him, you know, it's, it's, you don't realize this, but when you're, and this goes out to all of you listening as well, when you're listening to our podcast, I also feel like I'm with you. So be careful what you do <laughs> when you're listening to my voice. <laughs> But anyways, um, thanks to all the people up north and um, great people at Hartley Bay. So nice to uh, nice to give you a little shout out. And That's recognition. great. Yeah. I, so you mentioned the the hockey sticks, and that's sort of a way to sort of move us forward. And Rob Forbes, who's going to be joining us on the podcast in, in right. a couple of weeks, uh, is also very interested in that topic of NFTs. Now, for those of you who don't know what NFTs are, it's a very seemingly complex topic of conversation. I'll do my best to explain it without going into details. Essentially what it is, is uh, the way most people understand them to be. It's a a digital asset that is one of a kind. It's serialized. It's it's a form of a cryptocurrency, essentially, that that marks an item as unique. Even if it exists elsewhere on the internet in some form, the idea would be that you're taking a version of it and you're assigning it a unique ID that cannot be replicated. Therefore, you can be the only person to own the original of a digital asset. Or you can mint a, a, a serial number, essentially, and apply it to a physical uh, object similar to what we would get with a certificate of authenticity right. or a hologram number or something along those lines. Something that's unique, which has its uniqueness threaded into a digital asset as opposed to a physical one. That's that's more more along so, the lines of what so that is. So being an older guy, I don't get it as much as uh, Mikey would and his generation, but I am starting to um, really appreciate what this market is about. And I know um, Mikey, you've been doing a lot of research into it. We don't want to pitch this to our players until we have them really uh, in a good position to be at the forefront of the industry, not uh, at the end of it. Mm-hmm. And so you, Mikey's got some great ideas for this, uh, and he's exploring them now. We won't get into them, but we think it would be groundbreaking for NFTs if, if and when we do 
get into that mark. I think I think that's important because a lot of you who are listening, I think, will have heard what NFTs are. And the conversation that you will have heard likely surrounding NFTs has to do with the fact that there's a lot of money in them. It just seems to be this buzzword that, you know, they're selling at Christie's auction house for millions of dollars, these digital assets, and no one can really understand how a video or a GIF is selling for millions of dollars, but there is something to it. Now, the reason why it applies so well to the world of sports marketing is because one of the most prominent examples of it in the mainstream is with NBA Top Shot. Now, I, you're familiar with NBA Top Shot, yeah, right, Dad? Yeah. yeah. So essentially, the, the, the best way to explain it is a digital trading card. It's a, a video or a GIF that's been highly stylized, and you can own portions of one or one all to yourself, even though I may be able to go online and see what it looks like, just as I may be able to go online and watch a trailer for a movie. I don't own that trailer. I only own it if I own that digital asset. So they're often paralleled with what we would call digital trading cards. And now because of that, it opens up this entire realm of possibility for all sorts of sports. Uh, You know, whether you're going to create a new digital asset of, you know, of Sidney Crosby hoisting the Stanley Cup or something would be the traditional way of thinking about it if you're drawing a parallel with NBA Top Shot. Uh, There's also the ability to create a digital uh, certificate, essentially, that applies to a game-used item, for example, and says that any time this game-used item changes hands, the ownership of it is tracked digitally online. So that would be one way. Uh, oh, my dad just kicked the camera, and, and uh, you saw the look of panic on his face too. So that was kind of perfect. I thought it was going over. If you're watching on YouTube, which, by the way, if you are listening to this and you're subscribing on iTunes, uh, great, that's fantastic. But if you did want to see our lovely, tired-looking faces today, as we look into the cameras, we're, we're both looking a little tired. Uh, you can go find us on YouTube, uh, the Sign Off Podcast, the same way as you normally would. Uh, join us there. We've got quite a good community there. Now, what you mentioned, Dad, in terms of our uh, involvement in NFTs at our company company is that right now it seems to be that a lot of people because of what I'd mentioned earlier where people talk about NFTs in regards to how to make money are just trying to get in get their foot in the door somehow try to make some money off of it and what I fear that that does is saturates the market at a point before it's been innovated where the medium itself is something that takes advantage of its own technology as opposed to mimicking digital trading cards or mimicking physical trading cards in a digital form. There may be ways to make sure that a digital asset is a little bit more exciting than that. And until we find a way uh, with with the, uh, the partners that we've been speaking with to fully engage that and enact that, that's when we'll get involved. And we will be talking about that specifically on later podcasts as it comes closer to fruition. Yeah, we just don't want to get involved in something that looks like just a quick cash grab. And then we don't we want to add something to the industry as we always have. Right. So from day one, we've looked at ways to create new ideas, new innovations and stay with it and develop it. So to go in for a quick cash grab on a digital asset, not even caring what it looks like or what it's about. Uh, That's not what we're about. Certainly not for our elite players that we work with. Well, it's interesting that you bring that up is, is, you know, we are, as, as I'd mentioned, you just mentioned there uh, often trying to be on the forefront. We don't just want to be copying the technologies and the items that are out there. We want to be able to bring our own flair to it. And that's kind of what I want to go through in this episode. You know, right now we're faced with NFTs and the changing landscape as a result of NFTs in the sports marketing world. Everyone's reacting in some way or another. But what about all the other times it came up that it didn't make the mainstream like it did right now? And that's kind of what I want to get into. Now, I'm going to kind of lead us through some of the examples that I know of. And I want you to sort of speak on those, Dad. If if there's anything that I'm missing or anything more specific that that you've come across that maybe I'm not even aware of, I'd love to hear those as well. But I know for for one, ex- the example that I always give of a way that that you came onto the scene and really changed what people perceived memorabilia as, or more accurately, what people perceived as memorabilia, uh, came when you had approached, I believe it was the New York Rangers. In, in in a few years back, yeah, and and you had spoken about ways in which we could create a product line around items which would otherwise potentially be thrown out. Do you want to speak a little bit about how that came to be? Well, sure. Um, you know, working with with the New York Rangers, which is a long way from Toronto, right, and certainly uh, backyard of one of the bigger companies that was around back then, which is Steiner. 
Um, he was doing the Yankees. He was doing work with the, with the uh, Rangers. And then um, I had to come up with something different. I mean, he was already in there. And typically, memorabilia consisted of autographs. Right. You have an autograph, you're going to sell it, buy it, and whatever you're going to do with it. But um, what would, what I, how do I get my foot in the door with the New York Rangers? So I flew down there, and there was a very creative uh, marketing lady there. Uh, Marcy Davis was her name. And she worked for the Rangers and, and wanted to kind of, she saw some of the promotions that we had done previously with in-stadium promotions of, um, you know, framing tickets and things. So sure. that's really kind of got my foot in the door. So that would essentially be you show up to the stadium, at the stadium, uh, like on the night of a game, uh, you're handed a flyer, for example, where you can right. reach out to our company and we'll frame up your the ticket from that night, essentially, and send it back to you. Well, That's exactly. What you're talking about? So, yeah. so going right to the, the beginning, one of the reasons that I was there was we, we came up with the concept of, I, I know from, a lot of this evolves from my own personal uh, desires uh, with regard to memorabilia. So I, I have a box full of tickets going back to Elton John concerts in the, sure. in the 70s, and I just never threw anything away. Right. And, Years later, I open it up. You, you and mom used to call me a pack rat. And yeah. I think I now know where I get that from. <laughs> so if you go through the boxes of things and then you start looking back at a $15 front row seat to Elton John or, right. or a hockey game that you went to, it brings back so many memories. And and I cherish those before they were considered valuable. Um, what, one of the other boxes that you found recently is one that you gave me. Now, I've said this before on the podcast. Uh, I, I I suffered through my fair share of wedgies as a kid because of how much I loved and still love video games. I have a video game podcast called The Retrograde Podcast. If you're into it, you should check it out. Uh, and you found recently, basically my holy grail, a box full of Atari 2600 cartridges and old systems and games for a, a plethora of, of consoles and that existed still way back work. in the day. I don't know the, the consoles. I don't know if you've checked it out yet, but I thought it was kind of interesting. It was amazingly interesting because to me. Yeah. Space Invaders or whatever. You know the games better than I yeah. do. I forget what they were about. <laughs> so, um, so those things that you never threw away. And so when, when I was thinking about more current things that were important, um, we started with the Raptors, when they came to Toronto, the right. opening game. Right. And I thought, well, I'm not throwing my ticket away. And it goes back to the, I guess, the Blue Jays, too. Actually, the Blue Jays was the first one we right. did. And we framed up the ticket. So you could send in your ticket. People were, I noticed that people were bringing us tickets from the opening Blue Jay game right. to frame. And so I thought, well, geez, that's a good idea. I'm going to frame mine. And then after a while, I said, well, what if there was a service where we could give a specialized product. Right. And so we, we did with, with the Raptors, we had three different products and we had a, a small, medium and um, large package, um, all priced accordingly. One was just you frame basic eight by 10 framing your, your ticket with a little brass plate. Yep. And then the second was a, a program, a ticket and a pin and a, and a brass plate. And the third one was an autographed um, poster signed by uh I think it was uh, Isaiah Thomas, who was oh, wow. the GM at the time. And so there was all obviously something for everybody in a price range. And then we decided that we're going to put, back in those days, there was really no internet that you could order it from. So right. we, we taped an envelope that you could fill out the form and order your, drop your ticket in it, drop it off at a box at the on your way out. Oh, Many, so I was going to ask, were you actually framing the actual tickets or was this yes. a replica? So it was. So you were giving them the... And all, you were basically making it as easy as possible for them. Right. Saying, here's the envelope, put it in, let us know what you want, check the box, and we'll get it back to you. Right. And then they would collect them, send them to us, and we did two, 300 minimum just from that game before right. they started sending them in after. So that became a staple item for our company. Um, I took that concept. So we did a few other ones since then, and then the New York Rangers, this Marcy Davis contacted yeah. me and said, Hey, we have, I forget what it was, a uh, special event coming up, and they wanted to commemorate that. And so we, we, I flew down there, and literally while I was talking about that, um, she asked what other things we have that were innovative. And uh, <laughs> they were renovating Madison Square Gardens. We had talked about this on a previous podcast. And so I, I just kind of winged it and said, well, what do you got? And they said, well, 
well, you know, what assets do you have? And so, well, we're throwing all this, we're renovating, so we're throwing all the plexiglass out. And I mentioned this before. And I said, you know, it costs 50000 to get new plexiglass in there. And I said, well, give it to me. And she said, well, what do, you, what do you want with that? It's junk. I said, no, it isn't. I'll give it back to you, laser engraved, and you're going to sell it for $25 a, a, a piece of 8 by 10 all with the silhouette of Madison Square Garden right. and, and all that. And then she says, wow, that's amazing. They did. They got all their money back from the plexiglass. And then she started asking what else they could do. So essentially what used to cost them money to replace the plexiglass right. now became a profit center. Right. Which is, again, you talk about innovation. This is one of those things that we didn't see happening elsewhere. Our framework didn't see happening elsewhere. It was just kind of a way to push the industry forward. And that's why I mentioned what people perceive as memorabilia, because you may not have thought otherwise that a piece of game used Plexi is memorabilia. But what I love about products like this is everyone wants to have a unique piece of memorabilia. That's kind of why people love signatures, right? It marks it in time. You share something that at one point in time was shared by the athlete that you like or athletes. In this case, you own a piece of history. At one point in time, that thing that you now own was a part of an actual game. You were part of that team's right. history. And it's a much more cost-effective method of doing that than, say, getting a signature. You know, I, I, I can hear rumblings of people who don't quite understand the memorabilia market saying, no, you're just marketing trash as gifts and prizes. And that isn't it. Because I don't think anyone who buys these items, and they sell out, think of it that way. I do think that it's it's a matter of them saying, you know, in the same way that a drummer after a concert throws his drumsticks out in the crowd, he's not throwing them in the trash and someone's picking them up. The person saying is, you no longer want those? Okay, I want to be part of the experience that you just had. Now I'm taking these home with me. And that's, that's a very similar one. Well, if you take it to the next level, um, you know, what is now very mainstream, we took it from the plexiglass and we took the nets out of the game for specialty games. Some big uh, goal was scored in that game, and we cut the nets up, and right. we framed them up, and that was a piece of history that everybody got. But literally, I don't even think at the time Upper Deck was putting a piece of jersey in every card. I think we, we, we kind of opened that door. I could be wrong, but I, I don't think so. And then, then we started getting into pucks from the game. Well, right. You know, the players never picked up a puck. I said, collect every puck that's scored with. Right, right. And you, you would sure say this to the players themselves? No, to the team. Oh, okay, okay. The, I mean, the players will keep collect their own pucks right. for specialty goals. But they don't go to the net and grab every puck they score with. Right, it's right, right. It's the first right. one, it's a 100th one, or yep. whatever. Anything that's special. But the team gets to keep them all uh, other than that. And so we told the team go collect the pucks, and then market them in your auctions, which was another area that we, we innovated and got yep. going, which was uh, auctions within the building. That never happened until Maple Leafs did it in Toronto. That's and essentially that when, 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 you're, we were involved. when you're walking through any arena nowadays, yes. you see a stand or multiple stands where pieces of sports memorabilia typically pertaining to the game – one or both of the teams that are playing are being auctioned in a silent auction. After the second period, they close the bidding and all the winners get uh, right. an email. Now that never existed until we did it in Toronto right? with uh, Jeff Newman. And we started that, um, I don't know, probably mid nineties. And it just took off. That was to my knowledge, the first time that that had been done in any stadium. Now virtually every sport and every arena uh, does that does that yeah. and it's a huge money maker for the, either the team the team's charity or both yeah and we supply product to all of the, not all of those but many teams um that is an addition to what they can reap uh, the benefits from from the building right and that's that's another one of those great ideas where it it, it it's less about seeing what's happening in the industry and reacting and more about just ways, A, how do we get this memorabilia into the fans of the people who may not even know that they want it, right? You're walking through a hockey game. Every time you go to a hockey game, it's or, or a basketball game, a sports game, there's always this feeling of like, I want to take something home with me. You know, whether you're buying a jersey or, you know, a, 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 a authorized puck or authenticated puck or something like that, whatever it is, you want to take something home. And this is just another opportunity to do that. It starts with the ticket, which was the first thing we identified. Right. And then it moves on to, Hey, look, a puck. You ever see a, a fan uh, scrum going after oh, a baseball the, yeah. or a hockey puck that went over the boards? That was the second thing. Right. Like, why do people think, Hey, I got a puck that was used in the game, which got me to thinking, 
what other things come from the game that we could offer more people as, as opposed to I got to be in the right seat at the right time with my baseball glove or right. my, to catch that puck or the or the ball. I, I do I do love the idea that you're in this meeting and they're like, what else do you got? And it's like the scene from like a spy movie when they are like, what's your name? And they look around the room and they're like, uh, frame doorknobs worth. And you're just like, I don't know. Do you have like something you're throwing out that I could turn into memorabilia? And it, it worked I, out. I remember that being one of the most creative meetings I've ever had because literally on the spot, I started coming up with ideas and they were blown away. And then I went back to the office, uh, work, crunched the numbers to say, okay, if you got 20 pucks a game, um, you got one, two nets a game, blah, blah, blah. And you, you crunched the numbers. And we started, we started adding up what the value of that memorabilia was worth um, to the team, and it was pretty impressive. Yeah, I bet. I mean, that, it got. I mean, New York Rangers, one of the richest franchises in in hockey, and they were impressed with the potential numbers. So, and not to mention, it's something that most like the auctions. Something that most teams do nowadays. Um, every team, uh, right. and, and not only every team, but so so the the ironic part is is that you. If you want to stay ahead of the curve in this industry, you've got to keep creating new ideas, which is talk, we talk about NFTs and other things. Um, we used to go to the NHL and say, we want to buy that net from you. What's it cost to, to undo it? They used to give us a, a whole net for $500. Right. Okay. And nobody else asked for it, so it was just the cost of getting the net off and replacing it. We're an NHL licensee, so it helped them uh, help us create product that they sure. would then get royalties on. But once everybody saw that, then all of a sudden we said, well, we want the net. Well, how much are you going to pay for it? <laughs> There's NHL's a bidding war now. Yeah. Either. So uh, there were other people that wanted the net. Of course. Uh, and now, the, you know, and then the uh, game used jerseys, how valuable right. are those? Well, the company called Migrate came in and made a huge offer, or I assume a huge offer, to the NHL to grab all the game used jerseys, and we used to get them. The right. players used to get them, right? Right? Uh, they they want to take their home jersey. So now the PA had to get involved, and the player gets at least one, and blah blah. Right. But it just created this havoc that didn't exist back then. Right. Right. It's where where industry crops up. More people are going to come and try to put their stamp on it, and that's why you got to keep moving forward. And another one of those ways uh, that we did this was to try to innovate on things that already existed. And one of the th one of the examples of that, I believe, because I know we've done season ticket gifting for the Toronto Raptors and the Toronto Maple Leafs in the past. Now, uh, we'll get into in a second what those offerings were because we've done them two years, I believe, two years in a row. However, in the past. What existed out there for season tickets gift? You've had season tickets to the Maple Leafs or, or had back in the day when they were in the gardens uh, for forever. Was there any, was that such a thing as, as no. A, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, at, at least in Toronto, season tickets were impossible to get anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was sold out at Maple Leaf Gardens. The season ticket holders should have given gifts to the Maple Leafs for letting them have them. It was hard enough to get your hands on them. Well, the first that was place. it. I mean, I know my dad, um, spent years trying to accumulate some tickets so we could go to the games and right. he ended up getting some nice ones had yeah. some nice connections down there but and it wasn't that they just come available and they'd hand them out back then yeah. you have to know Har Harold Ballard made a good living out of just where those season tickets I would went. assume so yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe gave a couple of those season tickets to the cops who wouldn't ticket the cars outside it, it, of the gardens exactly. too right yeah so um so the season's tickets uh, the gifting didn't exist because they didn't need to do it. Right. Now as time goes on and the prices go up and they want to make sure that they, you know, it's a little harder to sell the tickets. And then maybe not in Toronto, but in many other buildings. Yeah. So they started giving out gifting. Um, and it typically would be a Toronto Maple Leafs hat or right. a t-shirt right. or something like that. Um, and then I said, well, let's see if we can come up with something a little more creative that has a much higher perceived value but costs you around the same. And, and this, this is what's important is when it comes to the, the concept of giving a gift out with your season tickets, no gift in the world that you can give to every person who buys a season ticket is going to be as valuable as half of a, as, as one period's worth of an actual ticket. Right. But the perceived value is what matters. Now, not only am I getting season tickets to the game, but there's an exclusive piece of memorabilia or an item that only I get for having these tickets. And right. that's where, when you talk about perceived value, that's exactly what that means. The cost of the item itself may be 
$50, but to someone who's getting it, it's essentially priceless. And that that's that's that line that you need to walk. You, you have to go, you have to be a season ticket holder to get that specific gift. Right. It wasn't just a hat that anybody could buy. Exactly. It wasn't just a t-shirt that anybody can buy. Even if it was a t-shirt with a little more unique design that gets worn, what are you going to do with it? But that was the case for a while. Oh. What were some of the ways that you tried to innovate in? How did you, how did you uh, expand upon that? Well, we tr- well, one for one thing, we made an exclusive book for them. That was um, great. Yeah. Uh, everybody got the book. We've now, the, done- the book, explain, explain what that was, essentially. Because if I recall correctly, it also had within it components of game-used items, right? right? It was a memorabilia book. So we would take, um, within the book, you could have a piece of the net from the game, a piece of the plexiglass, uh, a little vial of ice water from the game. So the little kind of fun things that you can collect. But then there was also, I believe, in some of the packages for some of the teams, an autographed photo. Right. um, An unsigned photo, a signed photo. and Not not to mention stories and images that were essentially exclusive to that book. And it was a limited edition book. Right. Only those people that were season ticket holders could get it. So consequently, um, the book idea actually had a a different genesis, which was um, for Live Nation. Through through Frameworth Publishing. Through Frameworth Publishing, which was a company I set up specifically for that. And that's another story. That's, that's a whole so other go, story. We won't that's, go down that's a that path one, yet, yeah. but it is a fascinating story because we had done, um, just by example, probably eight or ten million dollars worth of business with Live Nation in in, in within two or three years mm-hmm. from that product. Dealing with with clients like U two, Madonna, uh, uh, Which you was name it, it, amazing. It was all the biggest bands that were touring got right. on that board, and and it it all sort of spawned from this idea. From this idea, yeah. So um, actually the hockey book for the gifting evolved from that. But right. other things like a uh, piece of the basketball floor, you know, there's different levels too. If you're a, a sweet holder, you get a much higher gift right. because they're spending a lot more money with the team. And right. then you got things that go down from there in terms of value, uh, but all unique products. So that was the, that was another way that we've created and, and other companies much bigger than us have actually followed our lead instead of the other way around. Which has happened. I mean, you know, in this industry, there's a lot of give and take, you know, interacting with companies that are larger than, than ourselves. You know, we, we get inspiration from some other companies, but there's no doubt that a lot of the, the projects that we've brought to the market have changed the way that companies or, or sports teams interact with their fans or the items that they purchase or, again, what they consider to be memorabilia. I actually have a funny story about the books. I don't know if I've told you this story actually, dad. I know I haven't told it on this podcast yet, but the year that we did the books, the, the for the Toronto Maple Leafs, the, the season tickets books, I went out for drinks, uh, uh, with a friend of mine and we met at a bar and she was with a couple of her friends who were uh, an older couple and we got talking and, and I think the Leafs game was playing in the background or something along those lines. And the guy mentions that he's a season ticket holder. And I'm thinking, okay, cool. You know, we just finished this project of, of sending out all the season tickets. Not only did we build the season ticket gifting in the books, but we also emailed them out or emailed, mailed them out directly to each of the fans. So it was a big undertaking. We had a lot of involvement and I didn't say anything because I wanted to get his reaction on the gift that he got that year, which was the book, which we had worked on. And I was working very closely on it. So I had, I had quite a big hand in the way that it went to print and, and what was involved in it and how it was distributed. And then eventually uh, I let it slip that I was in sports marketing. And I mentioned that, uh, that the gift that he received that year for being a season ticket holder was part of our company. It was part of Frameworth, which is the company that I worked for. And he wasted no time telling me that he did not like that gift. Oh, really? <laughs> I couldn't believe it in front of everyone. He's like, no, that's just, what am I going to do with a coffee book? I'm going to put it on the shelf and I'm never going to see it again. And I was like, well, what did you get last year? He's like, well, you know, last year was great. I wanted something that was unique and people see it and they know I'm a season ticket holder. I'm like, okay, so what was it? And he's like, it was a luggage tag that said that I was a season ticket holder. And I'm like, okay, but like, what did the luggage tag come with? And he's like, no, 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 it was a luggage tag. And I was like, wait a second. I was like, the book came with a keychain that was made of plexiglass from one of the games. I'm like, why are you complaining about this? And uh, needless to say, I took it a little bit personally. But uh, but you know what? Everything we do is not for everybody. No, of course. A lot of people listen and go, 
we talk about piece of the net. No, of course. Yeah. Okay? Other people are going, I got a piece of the net. Yes. So it's all personal. Uh, everything that you do is, is kind of based on that. And some people like it, some people don't, as we know from the internet, where everybody has the ability to let you know what they think. And yep. we sure hear about it. One whether way or the other, whether it's the internet or just a couple that you meet a night at the <laughs> bar, <laughs> you're liable to hear what people think about it. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, it's a little bit easier to hear about that sort of thing on on the internet. Uh, have you ever had any projects that you attempted to bring to the marketplace that that would have been seen as an innovation but failed? I'm sure there's there's got to be some. Never, you can't, never. No, of course, <laughs> of course not. I'm, I'm trying never. to think. Yeah. Actually, um, there's been a lot of different. We just did one, um, which. I thought would be a great idea. Right. Um, We invested some time and effort, which was, and we've done this throughout our history. And every time we do it, it hasn't been as successful as I had hoped. So with Father's Day coming up, we missed Mother's Day by a little bit, but Father's Day coming up, um, one of my employees said, you know, we should do something specific to Father's Day. So we created uh, just our regular autograph piece of memorabilia. I think we did four or five or six different players to right. cover the marketplace and different price points, including, I think, Sidney Crosby. I was away for this uh, final uh, OKs, but they went ahead without me. Um, and you had the ability to customize the the plate. So you could say uh, to the best dad in the world. Um, Are you dropping a hint? I should have got you one of these. Uh, yeah. No, I don't need any more memorabilia. <laughs> so... So it's like to the best dad in the world. Uh-huh. Um, I know you're a big Sidney Crosby fan. Uh, here's whatever. It's just mm-hmm. a small, you have the ability to write the script. We would laser engrave it into the mat board. And you can give your father um, a player of his choice autograph piece. And um, it just didn't co- pan out the way we had hoped. We thought we'd sell hundreds of them. We yeah. sold a few. And, then, so, and we spent a lot of time on these. Over the years, that customized type of thing, um, we had a letter from Gordie Howe once when he was alive, that the letter would say, happy birthday. It was more of a generic letter, and he would sign the bottom of it. Right. And and we would drop the name of the person in, so to so-and-so, congratulations on your 84th birthday, blah, blah, blah. Right, right. From uh, your friend Gordie Howe, and he would sign the bottom and sign the That's a cool idea. It was really cool. Did that that sound well? Not nowhere near what we thought it would. It's it's bizarre because we get so many requests for things like that. Huge. And, uh, you know, maybe it's just one of those cases of one request sounding like a lot more people, but it's the vocal minority. Who knows? Like, you th- would think that that would be a lot bigger. Um, what about this as a, as a proposal of something to put on the plate? Um, to the greatest podcast co-host a son could ever ask for. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll sign a picture of myself to it. You know, I have... <laughs> You're a piece of work. <laughs> I, if, if you go in the other office when my father was alive for his 80th birthday, I had Wayne Gretzky, Gordy Howe, and Bobby Orr all sign to Harry. Wow. Best wishes on your 80th birthday, blah, blah, blah. And I framed them all together. That's amazing. And he had that, and he was so excited to get that. I mean, where do you get something yeah, of like course. that? I had to pull a few strings to get it, but uh, most of those guys were friends and still are. But... Um, but that's the kind of thing. Sometimes it pans out. Sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, I remember w- another one that we tried out. You know, especially back in the day, we used to try to use our uh, NHL license in as many ways as we could. We we dealt with a lot more companies like Avon. I'm thinking as a specific example, right. a company that sells to the end user through a catalog. Avon is or is not still around. I'm not 100 percent sure. I, I think they're still around, but nowhere near. They used to be a you know ding dong Avon calling was their yeah, slogan. Yeah, 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 yeah. Somebody would knock on your door, give you the catalog, and you'd order out of the catalog right. obviously in this day and age it becomes obsolete it's like the the adult version of the scholastic book fair which right. was which was great um but but they would also they would often ask for us to innovate on some of the uh, i hesitate to call them tchotchkes but like they were just little uh, branded items that were uh, a little bit less expensive but would be a way to show your support so we did things like steak knives playing cards, anything magnets, with a logo on it, anything with a logo on it sells. And this goes back to your, you know, you may see a piece of the game use net and think I, I would never want that. You may see a fridge magnet and think I would never want that. Well, guess what? A lot of people do. Uh, but I remember as part of Avon, one of the things that we tried out were uh, uh, kites or kites. Yes. Branded kites. And look, when you're trying to put a logo on everything you can in hopes that people want it every so often, 
you get a miss. And these kites, I remember <laughs> we ordered them from China. You actually- Well, went, wait, wait. I, I'll go yeah, back go to for the it, history go for of this. Yeah, yeah. Because we had a very creative uh, sales manager here back in the day, Lily, Lily. Neil Castridi. Yeah. Uh, passed away a few years back, unfortunately. But boy, did she ever do a great- And Avon was her account. Yes. And Avon drove a lot of business. If they liked something you did, they'd order 5,000 of them. Right. Uh, up front. So that was a big, big account, one of our biggest at the time. And so she convinced uh, Brian Duchek, our, our VP, and um, myself and her, we flew to China to the big uh, Canton Fair. Yeah. And what you do, you got to keep your eyes open. So you go around and you see all these booths, and some, most of them don't even apply. But then we saw a booth with a kite, and it had soccer jerseys on it. Right. So we thought, wow, you know, that would work. We could put our Maple Leaf logo or Montreal Canadiens logo on these Kelly, which, which is a great idea. Well, it's a fantastic idea. Okay, and well, in don't fact, go back. It's a, no, it's a no, great, no, no, no. I'm joking. It no, was, there yeah. was nothing wrong with the idea. Yeah. The problem is in that big Canton Fair, we didn't really have any wind, <laughs> and we didn't really have a chance to see if the kites actually flew. <laughs> they look like they would, sure, you know, but they're in this. They got hockey pants and the jersey. So we end up putting a big order. So did Avon. They got a few um, upset customers over that because <laughs> the kids would take these out and all they were good for was wall decor hanging from the kid's ceiling because they didn't fly. I remember we would we got a couple complaints and we're like, what are these guys complaining about? They're kites. They fly. Obviously, they fly. So out we went to the parking, parking lot, lot and we, we just just a bunch of adults with... <laughs> With logo kites in our heads, <laughs> running down the parking lot, and them just dragging on the cement, and we're like, there I was guess no we way those things were going airborne. And Not it was a, a windy day too. It was yeah, crazy. Yeah. Oh my god! So that was a hit miss. Um, but uh, there was poker chips when the those poker really fad, well. when poker really started to come around. We did logo poker chips and sets. That was a big thing. We did fridge magnets, which yep. was another big thing. Uh, where you could put your kid's logo, or, or, sorry, the your kid's uh, drawing on your refrigerator or school locker, yep. and then put the uh, four four little fridge magnets to hold it up, and you had you know your favorite things. There's all sorts of little innovative things that Lily created from anything. Yeah, that we came. Yeah, from. yeah. I mean that's so that's one of the ways. Uh, uh, you know, kind of the smaller scale of branding these items uh, in, in a way that a lot of customers will. I think that's that's a little bit more along the lines of, of you know, getting everyone involved in sports memorabilia who, who may not otherwise have been able to, you know, if you're paying for items like a signed photo or something like that. But there's a there's a another way that I think was an innovation that Frameworth lended to the company primarily because of our our initial beginnings as a framing company. And this method of gifting to corporate events like golf tournaments or or fantasy camps and things like that had become sort of synonymous with the way that Frameworth handled their business. And it got us uh, associated with a lot of high clients because of, you know, we talked about perceived value. And these items were essentially, you know what I'm talking about, right? The, the on-site framing that we would do at these tournaments. I'd like for you to explain, first of all, a little bit of what those items are. Uh, and, and then maybe talk about how the idea first came about and how you probably were called crazy for even proposing this in the first place, given the logistics that must have been involved. Well, not, okay, so what memorabilia is all about is just something that people see have a personal value to them. Um, and then, you know, some people are just in it to try and buy and sell and collect like stamps or anything else. But most people that collect, they see something in it that's something important to them. And really, all this business to me has been is, what do I like? Right. And, what, and if it works for me, I've been lucky enough to say, well, it works for other people too. Sure. Um, so think about the things that, are, that you appreciate the most about your favorite teams or the sports. You know, we talked about a game used puck that came over the boards. We talked about an autograph that you get to meet somebody and they sign it. Um, it's not. It's a lot better if you meet them and they sign it. That's really of cool. Of course, yeah. That's why these story, trade shows yeah. are so well. But the other thing that is like front and center that was easy to figure out was I wanted to have my photo taken with any celebrity that I met. Right. And sometimes that's difficult to do. You don't want to bother them. When, when you say I, is that you? Me like, personally. Because you, love, you loved that, right? Well, I mean, I, you, you, know, you don't have many personalized signed items, right? No. That's, that's not as much your... No, I, I'd rather have a, a photo memory of right. them. Right. Um, 
to get them to autograph my my photo with them means nothing. The autograph doesn't mean anything unless they, you know, in, in terms of value because right. it's to me. So if they happen to say to Brian, best wishes or had a great time golfing with you or whatever sure, it would sure. be, that was great. But the photo, which you've been in my office, is there's not an inch of space there. Every so often you let me into your office. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You so, do make me knock three times though. And then even if there's no one in there, you make me wait a little bit. It's yeah, awkward. Well, yeah. Everybody does. So, <laughs> so that to me was, was special. So now I'm thinking, well, how do we market that? And the cornerstone of our business has always been the manufacturing uh, of picture framing. Right. So we had the ability to do picture framing and, you know, you put your, you come in and we were always trying to be the best and the fastest. So turnaround times, I always said two to three days framing when it was typically other companies would be two, two to, to three, three weeks. weeks right? Yeah. Yeah. And that was something my father instilled in me. Best service, get you a lot of attention in charge a little bit more sometimes if you want to, but you got to have the service. Yep. So then I'm thinking, well, we do everything in the plant, but what if we could go, so I was at a number, I big golfer in the day, and so I'd be at a lot of celebrity events, and, and actually, geez, I wish I could get a photo. And, and typically, they would have a, somebody on one of the golf holes that would take a photo of you and right. your foursome, right. and I'd be there with Doug Gilmore or one of the players or whoever was And how, how would you get that photo? Well, what happened was you'd take the photo, you'd finish the round of golf, and at the end of the evening, they'd have them all laid out on a table, just take the photo from you, and just loose. off you go. Yeah. And after a while, I look in my desk drawer and I'd have about 10, 15 photos right. sitting in there. That, like a pack of trading cards right. just, just sitting but there. Yeah. What good are they in a drawer right. if it's a big memory? And I thought, wouldn't it be great? So I'm in the framing business. I frame up my photos and then people would come in my office and say, oh, I have a lot of those photos. Could you frame them for sure. me? So people started bringing in their own photos. Similar to the tickets where right. we started. Exactly. So then I'm thinking, well, what if we could offer that service instead of going out the door and picking up your photo, uh, you pick up the frame photo. Now it's ready to hang on the wall right. the minute you get back. And nicely done. And the prices that we're willing to offer because we're doing 144 at a time, right. we're really good to the client and they would either mark them up a little or very few would mark them up a lot. And they or, would or, the just, or, or just not even charge them for it at the end of the tournament. Right. It, was, it was part of the package for taking it was part. Always, yeah, it was and, always a, a gift. And this leans into another thing we talked about, which is perceived value. Right. You know, we're, we're treating it like a wholesale order. But because we're doing it all at one time and it's all the same framing, uh, uh, the customer's still going to get it and it's going to be unique to them. They got they got real good value out of it because even framing an 8x10 in those days might have been $150 right. Right retail. Right. Uh, we might have charged the client 75 bucks, But the person walking away not only got a beautiful frame job, but they also got the photo in there that was um, the treasure. How long ago did you start this? Do you remember the Almost first time? Almost near the beginning, probably 90. I, I know we got involved with Sun Life and Donna Nielsen, who was the wife of, uh, um, can't think of his first name, um, called Chief Nielsen, he used to play with the Rangers, and Eddie Shack's wife, Norma, who at one point we got to get on this show. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and so they got us involved with the NHL alumni. They used to run alumni tournaments, which was to support their lawsuit against... Uh, what was it uh, against uh, for their pension plan? Okay, and we get that's all right, story. right, right, right. So, um, so I got to know them, and they had a sponsor, Sun Life, and Sun Life increased their budget to handle these things, and they were a huge success. And part of the deal was I always got to play as one of the four in the tournament. My yeah. staff would go and frame the thing, so I got to play with Dave Keon, and uh, the the memories there. Gordy Howe would go around the course, and they had, all these guys would show up. And sure. Just a great party afterwards, and now that's so. You from the very beginning, I've I've worked a lot of these tournaments, and I've done some of the on-site framing for it. And I'm talking like two years ago, and people are flabbergasted at the fact that they get to walk home with a printed picture and frame of that day. Today, right back in the day, this must have been unheard of. To, to walk away with a photo like uh, this is before digital that. cameras. This yeah. is before. I, so we would have to. Take the film, arrange for a photographer. We used to hire Chuck Kochman Chuck, or, or whatever. Who to, was mentioned on uh, last week's episode with John McDermott as the photographer for the Blue Jays right. who took the picture it, of him and, uh, and Poppy. Chuck's a great photographer, great friend. So 
he would arrange to take these photos, get them developed at a photo, because they didn't have digital photos, had to get all developed in a certain size. We'd have the mats and the frames pre-cut, and we'd have people in, a, in the golf barn putting these things together while the people were having dinner, and then they'd all leave with it. Very unique program. It still exists today, and I'll tell you where it goes from there. You talk about people still excited about it. Yeah. Good friend of mine, uh, James Dodds with TD Bank, yep. um, and he has special luncheons uh, at the top of the TD Center for their top, top clients. The and, TD Tower in Toronto, yeah. Right, and from time to time, uh, they would bring in all their top clients. Wayne Gretzky mm -hmm. is associated with TD Bank. He would come in, meet and greet, take a photo with everybody, and then James said, well, wouldn't it be great to get him framed? You, you got a photo with Wayne Gretzky. You're going to get it It's framed. going to be framed eventually. And they're going to take it out, and they're going to spend a lot more money. So he would build that into the budget. Yep. And we would go down and do it. So we've done Doug Gilmore, Robbie Alomar, Wayne Gretzky. Jose Bautista. Uh, Bautista. And then we started arranging some of the players that he couldn't access. Like right. Mitch Marner came on board. We helped him get Mitch. And so all of that worked out great. And... Um, and, and these are the top, these are uh, CEOs of top companies. There's only 50 or 60 people right. in those lunches. Right. And these guys would walk out and be blown away. By the time they finished their day, they would be back at the office, hanging up the photos in their office. So that became a staple item for James. He's been a great customer of ours over the years. Yeah. What is. do you What do you get the person that has everything? Uh, and it's, it's a memory like that, right. framed up, ready to go. And right. that process has gotten you involved in quite a few different uh tournaments uh gifting ideas and and one of those is the Wayne Gretzky fantasy camp right I mean that that's uh, one that of the, the, the premier ultimate. ones the ultimate and that is worth three episodes in and of itself that whole process well we talked about Brad Jansen and he's yeah. going to appear uh he's going to come in tomorrow to tape our show tomorrow so that'll be next week's episode we'll we'll touch on that um because Brad is, was the one that introduced me to Wayne and his brother-in-law, um, uh, Mike Brown. Um, but because of that one event, which was, I mean, the granddaddy of them all for me, because I loved to, I was still playing pickup hockey. It was the last game I played was at the last camp. Uh -huh. um, and then my blades on my skates were so worn and I couldn't switch to new ones because I can't skate <laughs> in the new ones. I never got used to the, the hard shell ones. But anyway, uh, I... I work with them to help develop the camp and all the guys. Just we just to clarify, when, when you talk about the last time you skated uh, at the fantasy camp, was, it, you're essentially skating with all of Wayne's friends from back in the hockey days. So oh. you're playing with Paul Coffey. You're playing with uh, Kenny Lindsman was there that oh, year. Yeah, we we'll, we'll get into fantasy camps in general yeah. because that is huge and people would pay top dollar. Part of my deal was, like the golf, we do all the framing. I get a free spot, and, so <laughs> and then I, and then it rolled into uh, we do all the framing. Mikey gets to come see the uh, oversee the back end of it. So right. I got to go to Vegas. Yeah, as and well it was Las it. Vegas. They had them in L.A. and they had them in Phoenix. And each one was each each series of those when they moved it from city to city was unique in himself. But yeah. Uh, we'll get that's a whole that's a great podcast to talk about what happens at a fantasy camp because I played in that one. I played in Mariel Amuse. Yeah, and uh, but just to be. In the locker room with those guys, but we literally in the like this isn't a fly on the wall type thing. It's, I'll show you a picture. Well, I've got pictures of Wayne and I standing in the locker room in uniform, ready to go on the ice, right. and uh, portraits that we framed up for them. Sixteen twenty hanging in my office. Same with Mario Lemieux. Great, great camp. So we got involved doing that, yep. and as a bonus, I got to play in the golf tournaments and that. Which, Amazing, yeah. That's, That's amazing. I mean, just another way that uh, you try to innovate, and in this one, uh, you're 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 treated quite well for having done so. Oh. I mean, th that must be the project that got you involved with the most high profile uh, uh, jobs and events. It, it seems to be at least. Well, one thing leads to another because when one thing I will say is that we did a great job with all of those, right? And um, uh, and so people would come to it. And, well, we we got Mario's camp. Uh, because they they heard a lot of the same campers. It was a big ticket, you know. I think it was ten thousand U.S. to play in these things. Yeah. And when Mario did his tournament, he started up a fantasy camp again for his foundation. And um, first person they called was some of the people that played in the other camp. Right. And they said, "Oh, you got to get Frameworth in there to do this because it's an amazing 
Oh, amazing. Um, pros it. Yeah. So it was basically word of mouth that got you involved yeah. in the Wayne Gretz or the, the Mario so. Mew one as well. That's amazing. Well, look, that's about all the time that we have uh, for now. Is there anything we missed? Anything you got to bring up? Because we're, we're there's we're, so much more. I, you know, I get you can tell the enthusiasm that happens here when we start talking about these things because the the memories that I have from this industry because of things like this, the people that I've met, um, and at the fantasy camps, at the golf tournaments, as a relationship with with Wayne, you know, and I'll get into that. I met Muhammad Ali because of, of my relationship right, with Wayne. Right. So all of those things, you know, you just never get over that stuff. You know, I, I just consider myself a picture framer through the years. And then I start thinking about how lucky I am to have been involved with things like this. But I've always said to you, create the concept, think of something unique, put yourself in the right position and good things will happen. Mm -hmm. So that's the way our companies roll. Mm -hmm. Sounds a lot like how you put together a frame in the first place. Exactly. Think of the concept, put everything in the right position and hang it on your wall as a memory. Yeah. I love that. So once again, thanks so much for sharing your insight into the industry. I can't wait to talk more about it. And as we mentioned next week, we're going to be talking to Brad Jansen coming up, Rob Forbes about NFTs and everything in between. So until then, this is Brian Aaronworth, president of Frameworth. I'm Mikey Aaronworth. This is us signing off. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we made it to the end of yet another episode. Thanks again so much for joining us. You can find videos of all of our episodes on YouTube by searching the Sign Off Podcast. You can also follow us on Twitter at Frameworth Sport or Instagram at Frameworth Sports. And hey, if you're not sick of me yet, you can find me on Twitter over at, at Retrograde Mikey, or you can always find me embarrassing myself over on Instagram at Aaronworth. The Sign Off is a proud product of Fadu Productions and Sad Styles Productions, executive producers Mikey Aaronworth and Andrew Bascom. Until next week, this is Mikey Aaronworth, signing off. Furnished by Sad Styles Productions. Give me